Good evening. My name is Lynn Rottem, and I'm the artistic director here at the House of Literature in Oslo. And I have the immense honor of welcoming you all to this Nordic event with Joyce Carol Oates. Hosted by the House of Literature, Stockholm's International Writers' Stage in Sweden, and Louisiana Literature in Denmark. All three countries Oates were supposed to visit earlier this year. When the COVID-19 situation put a stop to that, we were thrilled that Oates agreed to do a digital conversation, which will be shown in all three countries. Joyce Carol Oates is one of the world's most critically acclaimed writers, and she is frequently mentioned as a favorite for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Since her debut in 1963, she has published more than 100 books, including novels such as The Gravedigger's Daughter, Blonde, Blackwater, and My Life as a Rat, which was recently published in translation in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Themes such as feminism, racism, violence, power, and powerlessness are central to her writing. And to talk to Oates about these themes and more, we are pleased to have Lynn Ullmann, herself a writer of a number of critically acclaimed novels, and her latest novel, Unquiet, has just been released in English translation. So here they are, Joyce Carol Oates and Lynn Ullmann. So I want to start by just saying, Joyce Carol Oates, it is such an honor to welcome you here to the House of Literature in Oslo. Um, I have wanted to speak to you for, you know, so long. You are a dream guest and I'm, I'm so happy that you're here. I wish that we could receive you in person and um, that will be another time. But right now, this is, this is the way it is. And so welcome, welcome to Oslo. Thank you. I wish I were there. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in my house in Princeton, which is four, four miles outside the village of Princeton, in a wooded area. When I look out the window, I see all trees. What else do you see? Well, if I, if I lean forward, I see a creek, and there is a lake. So I'm in a, I'm in a nice area. It's good for contemplation, good for a writer. And you mentioned when we were chatting a little earlier that it was it was it was an okay place to be in a in a lockdown because you can go outside. Yes, that has been really my salvation. When I was a little girl, I grew up on a small farm, and part of my my whole spiritual being is really connected with the outside world, with being able to walk in the woods or walk along a country road or through fields and look at wildflowers. So this is my salvation. If I lived in a city in a high-rise apartment building, I would be trapped because our government has handled the, the virus so poorly. There's no plan. So many people are marooned in the cities. So what do you think is going to happen now? Since well, speaking, speaking from my position right now, I think we're looking ahead very hopefully and optimistically to the election. Of course, we don't know what will happen in upcoming days and weeks because we've been living in a very unpredictable situation for several years now, where every day almost there's a, some new difficulty or some new paradox. You know, I just read um, Life is a Rat, uh, and Life is a Rat has, is newly published in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. And I was immensely moved by it. I actually cried a few times. It, it, it moved me on a very personal and a very um, sort of gut level. It was like a fist to the, in the gut, um, both for the violence. It describes um, the murder of a um, young African-American boy um, and also the fate of a very young girl um, who rats on her brothers because it was her brothers who killed the boy. 
Uh, there's something about your writing and about how you describe the vulnerability of girls in so many of your books. Can you talk about your, your obsession with, with, with the vulnerability of girls? Obviously, I'm drawing upon my own memories of being a girl. And my deepest memories are of feeling very, very young, emotionally connected with my family. And so the nightmare would be to lose my family. And I think no matter how old you become, in your deepest heart, you still have that feeling of intense yearning. It's even beyond love. It's something almost like what, a, what an infant feels for the mother. And could you possibly exist without the family? Because for many of us, we are expelled. Either we're expelled because of personal choices or time. As time goes by, we lose our parents. I remember thinking that I could not I just could not live without my parents. And then when my father died first, it was the most devastating experience. I felt that I could write, the rest of my life, I could write a novel, one after another, about that loss, which was enormous. Then I lost my mother, and I wrote a novel called Missing Mom. So I think those deepest losses for us are universal and we connect with one another. It isn't a matter that we cannot lose these people. We have to lose them, that's nature. But how do we survive? How do we live? Do we assimilate some of them inside us and we move on? In some cases we have to repudiate, we have to reject. In some cases we have to embrace. So all these possibilities are very exciting for a writer. In what way? To explore. For instance, Viola is so devastated when she loses her family, she doesn't understand the way the reader does. The reader knows that the family doesn't deserve her. We know that her ethical position is much stronger than theirs. But she doesn't know that. She made a decision to align herself with a morality that goes beyond the family. Rather than protecting her brothers who are guilty of a hate crime, as it's called in the United States, that's a hate crime. Hate crime is something enacted against somebody because you hate his, his ethnic identity. We know that she's superior to these brothers, but she doesn't really feel that way. She feels she's only 11 or 12. I mean, she's very young. She feels guilty for having confessed for them, whereas the reader knows that she should not feel guilty. So the novel is really about her working through her guilt. And when she realizes that she's a free agent, She's a young woman, about 20, by the end of the novel. Her life as a rat is over, and she moves into her own life. So at the end of the novel, the life of the rat ends, but her own personal life begins after, after the end of the novel. I hope that readers understood that. Um, I think absolutely. Um, <laughs> but vulnerability and... Um and a girl's vulnerability. And I think you, you said something very interesting that I wanted to unpack about, well, you used the word expelled, this, of, you know, that she's expelled or the, the girls that, that we're all expelled at some moment or other in our life. But also that sh the reader knows something that the little girl doesn't know. Um, she feels guilty for having done the right thing. Yes. But she doesn't know that that's what she's feeling. And this, this um, young girl's guilt and shame and love and yearning, um, 
and the fear of being expelled and actually being expelled. I mean, this goes through so many of your uh, of your novels, I think, with the, with the young girl or the young woman in that that position of of being expelled and feeling ashamed. Yes, I'm fascinated by the tension between being loyal to a very small unit, like a family or a tribal unit, for the ancestors or a national identity. Do we have a morality that's higher than that? Do we have an allegiance to something beyond just the family? And I think, I think that we do. However, in as life as it's lived, we're living in a domestic situation. So if you speak up against your own family, you will be expelled. And therefore, you have that tremendous loss. I think in the United States, it's an issue that comes up quite often in terms of politics. People are loyal to their party in politics where they should be loyal to their country. And there should be a morality a standard of ethics that's beyond politics and party. And this is an issue that's in the air that's discussed all the time in the United States. Do you think family is a kind of a little society so that when you're a writer and writing about a family, you are also writing about the structure and politics of society and a larger society? Yes, the United States, the United States is an immigrant country. The United States is founded and is, consists of people who migrated here from other countries. So as each culture of immigrants came here, for instance, the Irish, particularly after the potato Irish the tragic potato famine many many Irish immigrants came to this country and they all they all settled in one area in in urban areas therefore they were ostracized Irish were considered like african americans they were considered not white and they were they were discriminated against Therefore, if you were in an Irish immigrant family and a neighborhood, you had intense loyalty to your own family and to your neighborhood, to your ethnic identity. And so some of these ethnic identities, in order to make their way in America, they had to result, they had to resort to criminal activities. Therefore, there is instilled in people an intense feeling of loyalty. And you don't go outside your, you know, your little tribe. But unfortunately, within the tribe, if something goes wrong, for instance, there might be sexual abuse of, of girls by priests. Should you tell on them or should you just be very quiet? There's always been this culture of quiet. Say nothing. I think somebody wrote a book about about Ireland, about the IRA and their culture. Say nothing, you know, you don't tell. In my novels, I often explore the tension between the tribal and familiar injunction of not of saying nothing or admitting when there is a crime or going outside to the authority. That's why what Violet Rue does in My Life as a Rat is perceived as so disloyal. A few years ago, I read another book that has gotten, uh, that, that a lot of people are reading again or reading for the first time now of yours, uh, Blackwater, also about a very powerful man, man in office and a young woman. Um, this uh, relationship between the very powerful, abusive man and the vulnerable woman is 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 a theme in much of your work. Why why is that? I think I I think I discovered the theme as I was writing, <laughs> because as you speak about when you you just mentioned the Black Water, I saw the connection but I'm not sure that I always see these connections when I'm writing. I tend to write about subjects that are out in the culture. Remember, Stendhal spoke of the novel as a mirror held up to, to reality. So 
I'm basically writing about what's out there in the world, and we do see the misuse of power in a patriarchal society. Uh, how how do you think, you know, th- these are questions that have come up in a whole new way or uh, now with Me Too. How do you see that Blackwater is now being read and reread uh, by women of all ages in the age of Me Too and in the light of Me Too? I hope that people are rereading and with new eyes. I wrote another novel too that very much is part of the Me Too um, atmosphere called Foxfire, Confessions of a Girl Gang. And so along, along with that novel and Blackwater and maybe some others, I really was prefiguring the issues of the Me Too movement. The, um, the sort of compulsion that is put upon girls not to talk, not to complain. And if a girl does speak of some injustice or sexual offense against her, she's likely the one to be ostracized, not the man or the boy. And that is a prevailing situation, I think, still in the United States. But you've been writing about young girls or young women being abused or expelled or neglected by powerful men for such a long time. I'm just trying to, because when we started this conversation, you also talked about, you know, your own memories as a girl and that you carried them with you. Is is this something that you still carry with you, that feeling? I mean, you are now a writer, an author, a critic, a novelist, a world renowned, and you have written over a hundred books. Um, does, does that, that girl, do, do you, that, that vulnerable girl that is expelled, that is hurt, that is abused, is the, do you still carry her with you? Because it's such a, it's, it's so powerful when you write about it. Well, this is just coincidental, but my mother, of course, my mother was born a very long time ago. My mother, my mother was born like a hundred years ago, actually. Uh, the point I'm making is that my mother was the last born of nine children in an immigrant family. They were immigrants from Hungary. They were very, very poor, and they lived in a Hungarian enclave in Buffalo, New York. And because they were so poor, my when my mother's father died. He probably died quite young. She was given away by her mother to a family that had no children. When she was only nine months old, she was given away. So many, many years later, when my mother was over 80 years old, she was still remembering that. She was remembering that she was given away, that she became like an orphan, and she was adopted by another family. And so I was interviewing my own mother for Oprah magazine. And my mother started crying. She said, you know, I just felt so sad. I was given away when I was a little girl because my mother didn't want me. In other words, my mother had a complete life. She was a wonderful, wonderful mother with a family and a a loving husband. She still remembered what it felt like to be given away. So we never get over that. We carry the earliest feelings of our lives with us to the very end. So when I'm writing about a subject that seems remote in time, it's very immediate to me. So you are in in some way carrying your mother's story with you. So when you write about a 12-year-old, there's something of your mother in that story? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I have a new novel called Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars, which is a novel that spans a generation. It's about a woman, a woman of about 60 who loses her husband. And she has children. And the, ch- and the novel explores the grief that they all feel 
like the youngest daughter loses her father, the uh, her brothers and sisters lose their father. To each one of them is a slightly different father. That they have different perspectives on this person who has died. So the widow is grieving for her husband, but the children are grieving for their father, even though um, they're quite mature. I mean, one of them is about 35 years old. But when you lose a parent, you could be any age. It's a beautiful novel, and I look forward to it being translated for everyone to read in, in, in Scandinavia. It really is. I mean, loss and grief um, are such a big part of, of your writing. Um, why is that? I do write about loss and grief, but, but as in Night Sleep, Death the Stars, I do suggest that there are many new beginnings. There's a Jewish expression, a door closes, another door opens. So we have to remember, even in the bitterness of grief, there may be a door opening in a few months or a year, but there will be another door opening. Do you really think so? Oh, yes, I believe that because that's happened with me in my life. Yes. Yeah, it has, and, and other people as well. Yes, I'm surrounded by people in my, my age group who have suffered losses, and definitely something new happens. <laughs> I mean, not to go into details, but you can never, you never say never. There's a saying in boxing, never say never. <laughs> you said in a uh, recent speech when you accepted the Jerusalem Prize for the Freedom of the Individual Society, uh, you spoke in that speech when you accepted the prize. You spoke of art's role in bearing witness. Um, and you said that um, bearing witness is protecting the vulnerable, the orphaned, and the disenfranchised. Do you feel that that is your role um, as an author to, to bear witness? I think because I, I began as a writer when I was so young, I was really living, I was living and reliving my life as a, as a young girl in a farming area and in a very uh, uncultured part of upstate New York. Um, I mean, we're, talk, we're not talking about New York City. We're talking about a rural community where there was very little education. So there was a lot, a good deal of violence against children. There was family and domestic violence. I'm thinking of fathers who would beat their children, liter literally beat their children who are my friends. And I was often uh, thinking about and writing about girls I went to school with who never graduated. And they never had, they never had a chance. My own family was very supportive of education for, for me. But these other girls either got pregnant when they were in eighth grade or they, you know, they dropped out of school. They got married when they were 16. <laughs> so I've written a lot about those girls because, of course, they would never be able to tell their own stories. Then as I got older, I got more interested since I was living in Detroit, Michigan. I got interested in telling the stories of people whom I had never met, but people who I, I read about or maybe uh, were living in the same city I was living in. I would do research for a novel like Them or a novel like A Book of American Martyrs. In fact, I do research for many of my novels into the lives of people different from myself. They could be people of color. Uh, they could just be poor people, uh, working class people from the South who are not in my own family, but I felt that I could connect with them because they, they reminded me of people in my own family. When I wrote my novel Blonde about Norma Jean Baker, who becomes Marilyn Monroe, I really connected with Norma Jean because she was sort of like my mother. She, she reminded me of my own mother. How? So, How? In well, what way? Because of just the, the fact that she was so poor, 
She was an orphan. She wasn't, she was actually given away by her mother. Um, my, my own mother was never in an orphanage, but Norma Jean was in an orphanage. Uh, Norma Jean never had a father, and my mother's father had died. And, and I thought of both of them as being very tough. You have to be so tough to survive. Norma Jean Baker had a mother who was schizophrenic, who couldn't stand to touch her. She didn't want to be hugged. The mother put Norma Jean in a foster home and in an orphanage. Uh, she basically wasn't a mother. So Norma Jean couldn't be adopted because she had a mother. So it was a paradox. You know, last week uh, in this same house, the House of Literature in Oslo, um, I interviewed a colleague of ours, uh, the American poet Terence Hayes, who who writes um, a lot about fathers. And, and it reminded me of that because you were just talking about mothers and, and you have spoken of your mother. And actually, Terence Hayes... Um, has a question for you. If you will listen now, uh, I will ask the sound guys here to play the question from Terrence Hayes. Well, you know, I would see Joyce every now and again. It's been a little while, especially with the quarantine. I would see her around our creative writing house at NYU when she would come in and teach classes. And I miss her now that she's gone. If she was teaching or when she teaches, and these young writers are in front of her, what's she gonna tell them? You know, I'm still trying to figure that out too. How would she keep them focused? How would she, um, how would she distract them? How would she direct them? Um, because I'm wondering myself, that's the first thing I wonder, what is anybody gonna do with anybody under the age of 30? <laughs> because everybody at the age of 30, at least, is certainly gonna be needing some direction and some help here going forward after the whole thing coronavirus, Trump, the universe. So I just wonder what uh, she and her wisdom would do on that first day of class. Well, that's interesting. Of course, I'm still teaching at NYU, but of course it's all shut down. So we're not going to see one another for a while. But I have been teaching there and I will be teaching my class at NYU in about a week or so actually. Well, it's such a good question. I probably would tell my students that they should write out of their hearts, you know, that write about what they want to write about. They might want to write about the current situation politically and emotionally. They might want to write some confessional first-person journal-like memoirist work about what it is to be, you know, 22 years old in a pandemic. Or they might want to write about something that has nothing to do with it. They might want to be like Emily Dickinson. She's not, Emily Dickinson didn't write about the Civil War. Walt Whitman did write about the Civil War and, and, and they were contemporaries. So basically, I would just tell my students to do what they feel they were born to do, you know, to write, to write their hearts out. And I think if you approach all the writing and prose and poetry from that perspective, you can't go wrong. You may you may end up writing about politics because you want to, not because somebody says you should be. You know, it reminds me what you just said now. I have to say to our audience that you have notifications on your computer. So when we hear the pling, it is from your computer and uh, it's... Wait, I I can't turn it off, otherwise I wouldn't be able to hear Lynn. <laughs> so it's just one of these built-in flaws in the computer. But this is the kind of thing that makes us, even though we are very far apart, it makes us these strange little things that happen on Zoom. It makes us closer and more intimate in one way because we're um, here with you and your com and I can hear every time your computer says pling, and then I know somebody else wants to talk to you too, and I'm very happy that I'm the one who's talking to you right now. Um, well, also, 
I should tell you that I have a kitty in the room with me, and this little kitty gets jealous. So sometimes when you're talking to me, the little kitty comes over and bites my toes. <laughs> She's Thank so you. jealous. Like, why Why am I focusing on this person in Oslo when I could be petting her? <laughs> what, what? What is the cat kitty's name? The kitty's name is Lilith. Lilith. I'm not sure where she went. Then I have another kitty named Zanchi, but they go in and out. But the one of them gets very jealous. And so once in a while, I would kind of go like this because she was biting my toes. <laughs> uh, I I read something uh, thinking about both you and and Terence Hayes um, in a lecture later published in a book um, in a lecture called "Is the Uninspired Life Worth Living?" I love that title. Uh, you talk about the importance of fierce attentiveness to the specific. I feel that that is something that you and Terence Hayes have in common, the fierce attentiveness to the specific. Can you tell me what you mean, mean by that? Well, that's what I noticed in your memoirist novel, that fierce, a passionate, loving attentiveness to specifics, to replicating the father's language, even when he's stammering and he's not able to quite remember and to describing atmosphere, which is so hard to describe in your novel. It's translated unquiet in, 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 in English, un, unquiet. And I, I thought that was so touching and opening your book anywhere, there's a rawness to it. And I just felt I could be that person. If I had a tape recorder trying to record my father, I mean, I would never have thought of doing that. But for you, that would be natural to do because of your background. My background, nobody would think of doing that. But of course, it would be like a sacred opportunity. And even, the, even when it's a failure and something goes wrong, that's part of the experience. So we do live our lives in terms of these specific details, the richness, and that's why we love our friends. There may be some special quality to a friend that's annoying or exasperating, but endearing. You know, the little habits and mannerisms that our friends have or relatives, they may be in some ways annoying. <laughs> But yet we love them. We love them for those habits that they have, which somebody else might not appreciate. Thank you for those words uh, about unquiet. That means a lot to me. Um, and, you know, I, I, I want so much uh, to ask you um, about your grandmother, because in the speech... Um, where you accepted the Jerusalem Prize, you talk about art as um, bearing witness, and you've spoken eloquently about that today. Um, but you also speak about your grandmother. So much of the speech is about your grandmother, and you, you talk about that she was the one who gave you books. She was the one who read for you. And that reminded me of my grandmother, because my grandmother was a bookseller, um, And she was the one, she gave me books and, and, um, and, but then you say, you, you write, it would not be until after her death that we came to realize how little my grandmother spoke of herself and how little we knew of her. And I'm wondering if this, this woman who you knew so little about, but who was so important to you. I'm wondering what kind of um, meaning she has had in all your writing. We've talked about your mother, but, but, but your grandmother, this mysterious woman who nobody knows anything about. Tell me about yeah. her. Well, she, she was a, a fascinating person. I, I wrote a novel called The Gravedigger's Daughter, which is basically about the life 
the, the, the secret life of my grandmother, but it's mostly fiction. I had to, I had to imagine it, imagine her, her, she had a very difficult life. She is from a Jewish family, but they were Jews who came from Germany in the late 19th century to upstate New York, and they did not want to be identified as Jews. So they were, by they, I mean the parents, because the my grandmother was the child. She wasn't really part of uh, any decision, but they did not identify as Jews. So they, they never acknowledged their religion. Oh, they didn't have any religion. They wanted to put history behind them because of the anti-Semitism of Europe and the barbarism. And then, of course, during the Nazi era, uh, they particularly, they wouldn't have wanted to acknowledge that they were Jewish. So my parents, and even my father, who was my grandmother's son, um, never knew that my grandmother was Jewish. Only when a biographer wrote about me and did some research, it came to light. Her name was Morgan, Morgan Stern, which was translated into Morning Star. But the name actually, or the, the Jewish name is Morgan Stern. That was the original name. So it's a long story. And she, my grandmother was... Uh, the most important person in my life shaping me as a writer because she gave me all my books. When I was a little girl, she gave me my first real book, which is Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. I was eight or nine and that changed my whole life. I had no idea at the time, but it was like the main, the great book of my whole life that my grandmother gave me. Then she gave me other books and she gave me a toy typewriter. Then she gave me a real typewriter. <laughs> and so she started me on a world of storytelling and reading. That's been my whole life. Now, my parents were not like that. My parents were not, uh, I didn't get this from my parents. It was from my grandmother. Later on, my parents were, were readers of my writing. And my father even went to college as an adult. But it all came from my grandmother originally. You know, attention, so important to a writer. And you've written about that, you know, the idea you know, us, that we have to be attentive to what's around us and all the distraction. I mean, when, when, when the lockdown happened, I talked to a lot of writers and I felt it myself. I wasn't able to write, I wasn't able to think because I was just so distracted. My attention was was taken from me. Is this something that you experienced or or well I think so. It's a little hard for me to say because I also lost my husband in April 2019. So that was such a devastating loss for me that my concentration was shattered then. And so the pandemic for me is like the same thing intensified, you know? I can't say that my life would be so different. When you have a tremendous personal loss, that is so, it's so close to you, you know? Everything is filtered through that loss. So I'm not, I'm not really able to say that my concentration definitely was shattered, but I don't know if it was, you know, already shattered because of, losing my husband, obviously living alone, one has a lot of time, but oddly enough, the more time you have as a writer, sometimes that backfires. If you have only one hour to work, you might work really hard. If you have 18 hours, you might fritter it away and uh, you, lose, you can lose all the 18 hours. So I agree. Uh, I think that the loss of concentration because of the pandemic was serious, but more in the beginning. It's it's a little bit we're getting used to living in isolation now. Uh, many of us do see friends. We keep a social distance. And we wear masks in the United States. I don't know, you know, what are people doing elsewhere. So we're learning to live to survive, I think. And so I think we're gaining back our sense of concentration. 
Are you writing anything now? Right now? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, right now? I'm, yes. I'm working on a novel that I began quite a while ago, and I'm working on a collection of short stories. After I publish stories in magazines, I usually revise them. So I take a collection of stories that has a theme, and I rewrite most of the stories to, to connect with one another thematically. I don't usually just gather stories together, um, you know, individually. I try to make a collective so that the first story leads to the second story and the third story. And then the, the final story in the, connect, in the collection will have some resonance with the first story. So when I'm, when I'm working on a book of stories, it's almost like writing a book. And I'm doing that, I'm revising. So that's been very, very wonderful. In a pandemic, revising is much easier than writing the first draft. What comes first? And this is my, my last question. When you are writing a novel or, or any kind of book in any genre, what comes first? The, the form, the structure, or, or the plot, or the, the voice? What, what is it? that comes first to you when you start on something new? Well, you mentioned, you mentioned my novel, Black Water, and that was a story that uh, was, a, was floating around America about the Chappaquiddick incident. It was a tragedy, of a, from, particularly from a woman's perspective. A woman had been victimized, but the woman had no voice. Like nobody thought about her and, and nobody cared about her. She more or less disappeared. I wanted to write a short novel, and I chose the form of the ballad, like a musical form, because it was like to me like a medieval ballad of a girl who had been violated, taken out into the woods, and left to die in the woods by a seducer. And so the, nov the novella took the form of really short chapters always repeating one line as in, as in a chorus. So to me, the form of the ballad was the perfect form to tell that story. In other cases, I have novels that are more about families. And so I have to have a, an older generation and their children and the children growing up. So that might be a three, that might be a three part novel with three sections. The first generation growing up and the second generation being born and then the th second generation growing up. So a lot of my writing depends upon the, the, the vastness, you know, the size of the story that I'll tell. Joyce Carol Oates, thank you so much for joining me here. I want to give you a hug. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here is a hug. Um, I hope we will meet again in person. I hope uh, so. Thank you so much on behalf of everyone, uh, myself and everyone in Norway and Sweden and Denmark who will be partic participating in this conversation. Well, I have, I've visited those beautiful countries in the past, so I'm looking forward to visiting those beautiful countries in the future. Thank okay. <laughs> you. I, we look forward to having you.